Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a legend of the 80s in my book, a huge legend, Doug McKeon. Yes, you may remember him as Jonathan in the classic 1985 teen sex comedy coming of age movie, Mischief. And he was Billy Ray, Jane Fonda's son, in On Golden Pond. And I'm having him on the podcast today to talk about those roles and several others, including um, a couple years ago, he played Hubert Humphrey in the L- LBJ biopic that Rob Reiner made with Woody Harrelson. And that movie, I don't know what happened to that movie. It just escaped. It didn't become successful. And I'm so surprised why, because biopics usually are... But in the last few years, a lot of biopics haven't. So I'm going to have him on the show today to talk about that and talk about his amazing career, being a former child actor and graduating to adult roles. And I can't wait. You know, I'm so lucky. I've I've gotten to the 400s of this podcast, and I'm just so lucky with the people I get and stuff. And I just couldn't be more honored. So, yeah, here is my interview with Doug McKeon. Hi, Doug. Hey, Tommy. How are you? I'm good. How are you, sir? Good. Thank you for uh, for setting this up. This will be fun. Oh, yes. My pleasure. I've been a big fan for a long time. Um, you? My, my birthday is a couple days before yours. Is that right? Yeah, June 6th. Oh, great. What year? 1983. Mm. I wish I was 1983 right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was older. <laughs> <laughs> now slow down. You yeah. Know, uh, enjoy what you got. <laughs> I do. I do. So going back to the beginning, I mean, obviously you were a child actor. Um, at what, what age did you fall in love with acting? <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, because when I got, when I started, it was really rather by accident. Uh, and I say that uh, I didn't have a stage mother or a stage dad, you know. <clears throat> I saw some of that when I was growing up, but mm-hmm. um, really it was, just to kind of give you a, a little bit of a backstory, there are six kids in my family. I'm the, I'm the third of six. Mm-hmm. One of my sisters <clears throat> was doing a dance recital, and a, a, like for ballet, and a, a talent scout. Uh, I grew up in northern New Jersey. A talent scout happened to see her. And so wanted to approach my parents about the idea of, you know, seeing that we had a large family and, and really was more interested in, in, in signing up the girls. That, you know, she just thought uh, there were four sisters in my family. And, and so right. to maybe bring them to a child children's agency, <clears throat> excuse me, in New York. And so to answer your question, when... You know, when we did that, and the agent said, well, what about Doug and the whole thing? And, you know, so I was signed up as well. It was really a lark. I mean, it was it was doing mo- it was modeling clothes for magazines like J.C. Penney and Sears and Roebuck and um, and then eventually getting into commercials. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, then, uh, you know, everything was a step to doing something more and something more uh, off Broadway. But. Everything was also very big and very grand in terms of, you know, when you did commercials back then, you were bubbly and you were vivacious. And when you were modeling clothes, you were kind of stiff and you had to. <laughs> so nothing was nothing was gearing me towards being an actor, you know. And mm-hmm. it wasn't until, until the soap opera The Edge of Night when I was around eight years old. Um, and this was, back then, this was still live television, The Edge of Night was one of the first soap operas ever created and was one of the last to actually go from live TV to eventually tape. So the first year that I was on The Edge of Night, we were still live. And um, when we went to tape, Mm -hmm. I was able to, you know, you you perform uh, an episode and then it shows a day or so later on TV. And, you know, I wasn't working every single day. So if I did an episode so many days later after school, I was able to see it. And it was the first time that I was really embarrassed uh, when I actually saw what I was doing because I didn't, I, I I had a real sense in terms of what was, what was good and what wasn't, you know, what was, what was natural and what wasn't. And I had never gone.
gone to an acting school. I never sought any instruction. Mm -hmm. But um, I took what I what I was doing very seriously from basically that point forward. It was it was kind of a sense of pride, if you will, that I didn't want to I didn't want to look I didn't want to look so cartoonish anymore. And mm -hmm. so it's it's around the, the time of eight or nine years old that I really started taking a, a, an interest not only in the craft and really studying studying other actors, studying you know identifying with 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 what I consider to be really good actors even. Before my time, you know, basically adult actors. I remember when I was hitting my teens, I just thought James Dean was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. And I was watching Rebel Without a Cause. It used to be, and I just started identifying more and more. And I, you know, I consider myself really a product of the '70s. And there were some really interesting films, in particular, that were coming out of that time period. And so I was enamored with a lot of the work, a lot of the films, a lot of the actors <clears throat> from that time period. So. So it was still at a young age, but it, it wasn't until I, I'd basically been in the business, you know, more or less, for about three or four years before I really started taking it seriously and taking the craft seriously. Wow. So, and, uh, did you eventually, like, you know, start doing theater and all that, too? I, did, I didn't do as much theater as, and I loved theater. I thought, it, you know, it was wonderful. It was just, as a kid growing up in northern New Jersey, it wasn't, it wasn't so much like I was I wasn't going to be doing my high school theater and, and things like that. I was more, you know, if an opportunity to do off Broadway. I did some off Broadway, I actually did a Broadway production that never took off. It was a wonderful <clears throat> ensemble of characters. The people that were behind um Greece, which was at the time the longest running Broadway show. Um, Patricia Birch was the choreographer who then turned director for this one project called uh Truckload. Mm -hmm. And um, we just we we were supposed to have an opening um, on a particular date, and the show just wasn't going very well, and we basically closed before uh, before we opened. But we just had a, you know a wonderfully talented group of, of people there. So being a, a young kid, still going still going to school, um, it wasn't as if I was a young actor living in New York, and I had a lot of that opportunity. It was it was balancing schoolwork and there was there was more television opportunity for me than there was theater when i came out to los angeles mm -hmm. i went to school out here to usc and then just kind of set set down uh living out here uh, i started work and doing some more theater out here as well especially at the uh, pasadena playhouse um the theater is it's something that I, I love and i encourage anybody if i'm ever asked to talk or give advice you know, theater is such an honest form, obviously, of, of what we do. Mm -hmm. There are no second takes. Um, you are, it's, it's immediately gratifying. Um, you can feel what the audience is feeling and thinking. Um, it's, it's a true measure of, of, of your ability. So, um, you know, I, I, I sense that I'll, I'll, throughout the rest of my, my life, my career, I'll, I'll, I'll gravitate back to it at some point. But um, it just wasn't always there for me. Mm -hmm, I see. I was reading on IMDb that one of your first like TV credits, you were in a um, Norman Lear produced pilot revival of The Little Rascals. <clears throat> yeah. Again, one of those projects that um, you didn't. I, you, no one knew if it was actually going to happen or take off or what have you. Uh, but uh, a young Gary Coleman was actually, you know, a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, the, doing a television series uh, is, is such a strange animal. It certainly was back then in that you, <clears throat> you basically, you, you performed, you shot basically a certain amount of episodes, 12 or 13 episodes, and then sometimes those things never saw the light of day. In this case, I think we just did an extended pilot, maybe one other episode, and it just never, it never grabbed, it never took off. And um, I was originally um, cast to play the, you know, the revival, the, the revival of, uh, of Spanky, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, that, during right before production started, basically they had this other uh, character that they created, kind of a, a spin-off character called uh, Zip Code, I think it was called. It was called, and so basically they created that character for me. Mm -hmm. Like it just never gelled. It never, it never really went anywhere. But yeah, I mean, the, the thought of <laughs> trying to, trying to 
uh, do something that was just so classic. One of my favorite shows, obviously, as a kid growing up, and the fact that we were actually going to try to reboot it and, and, and do it again, it, it just uh, it was kind of surreal. <laughs> yeah, that just must have been hilarious, especially to think that uh, Gary Coleman playing Buckwheat. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you had that core, you had the core characters, you know, the alfalfa, the spanky, the Buckwheat, but then you had some of these other new characters. And, but it was interesting, I mean, so you saw a lot of these very talented kids, um, you know, at the time, and obviously Gary Coleman went on to do uh, different strokes and, and have, have a, a career uh, for himself. But, um, I mean, it's just kind of, it's really just the nature of the business. I did another series with Ryan Dennehy called um, Big Seamus, Little Seamus. Mm-hmm. And this was for Lorimar Productions. And Lorimar's big um, series at the time was Dallas. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when you do a pilot and then you get the news that it's a go and it's going to be a series, you get very excited. Back then, you shot 13 episodes right off the bat. Um, I remember doing this whole publicity thing for CBS and, it was really a big deal before before we even aired, but they put us on Saturday night against Love Boat, you know, and Love Boat was you know, just this monster of a show at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, we literally were on for two weeks, and we, we were canceled after two weeks, and no one told me or us, um, for the most part, we literally tuned in to the third week, you know, the third Saturday, and we weren't on the air. Wow. And uh, it was then that we found out that, no, it's not going to happen. I mean, they didn't... You know, back then you would have wished that they would have at least tried to move you to another night. Um, Seamus means detective, basically in Irish or Gaelic, and um, so it was kind of a father-son, if you will, detective team uh, in you know set in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And uh, you know, it was kind of a cute premise, uh, but they didn't even bother to try to move us to another night to see if we could find an audience. We just the ratings just they, we got the story by Love Boat, and that was it. So. Um, and then, you know, you have, as an actor, you have this mindset of, of, of learning about other actors who are on a successful TV series, and they just choose to leave it, you know, because they think that there, there might be a, a greener pasture there in movies or what have you, and it doesn't always happen that way. I, you know, if you're on a television series that, that works and goes, I think you just you ride that forever, you know, because it's, uh, it's, it's what we do, first of all. We're actors, so we're there to entertain, but, I mean, it's... You know, especially if you have a family and you have a way of supporting them, a series is, is certainly the way to do it. Yeah, I, I think it's rare now, though, that people leave um, a series, you know, halfway through when it's a hit to do movies. Um, but I do I do know this, though. I mean, when, when Bruce Willis did Moonlighting in the 80s and and they had this weird schedule where, you know, he was he was making a movie while doing the show and they would, like, shut down production and stuff. I know that now, you know, they have, like, lots of ensemble shows just in case something like that ever happens again that so, that someone can, you know, carry the show while the other person is off making a movie. Well, also, Tommy, I should point out that the, the thinking back then is so different than it was today. Yeah. Uh, I remember, you know, my representatives basically telling me that if you really want to be considered a, a movie actor, you didn't really do television. And if you did television, it had to be a really special project. It had to be a big you know, movie of the week, you know, back then, uh, or something that could justify why you did the television or miniseries, which were popular back then. But the, the one actor that truly broke down all those barriers at the time in the early 80s was Michael J. Fox. Mm-hmm. Michael Fox was on um, Family Ties, and that became obviously a huge television hit. But he, once he did Back to the Future, um, you know, all that were off because it became, a, so he basically, he showed everyone how you could basically jump from a television series and also be considered at the time like the number one movie actor in, in the country, mm-hmm. not the world. So he, he broke a lot of those barriers down. But before then, truly, you know, you if you were doing television, you basically were considered to be a television actor and or star, and, and that's the lane you had to stay in. And you didn't really you really weren't able to cross over, you know, into, into, into films. You might be able to dabble in it, but no one would take you seriously kind of a thing. So yeah. now, and now television is so good. Uh, you know, the, the cable series that they now have, uh, it's, it's obviously the Netflix and the Showtimes and the HBOs 
um, and the other cable networks are putting out such good work that it's uh, the, the playing field is so completely different now than it was way back, uh, you know, when I was uh, when I was starting out. Mm-hmm. You you did a couple episodes of um, the miniseries Centennial. Yeah. Um, that must have been huge. With with you know. That must have been amazing with that huge cast of superstars and massive budget. It was fantastic. We shot it in Colorado. Uh, one of my dear friends today, who is a writer producer, John Wilder. Uh, I also worked with him in a, in a in a television movie, Breaking Home Ties, that he wrote and directed. Uh, such a class act of a person, and uh, he's he's just he's been a very important part of my life, even when I was. Uh, seeking uh, to go to college to USC. He wrote a recommendation letter for me, even though he's a UCLA alum. And mm-hmm. he, he, we, we kid each other all the time. But he uh, just such an instrumental part of, of my young life, and he was responsible for, for, for putting that whole um, miniseries together. And at the time, it was huge. I mean, it was like an 11-part series with you know, a who's who of people you know, in, in the industry. And uh, Anthony Zerbe played my father and Lois Nettleton, my mother, and they couldn't have been nicer. We were playing this theatrical family. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, um, it was just, it's, it's, you know, it's fun as an actor when you slip on period clothes especially and you feel like you're, you know, you're back in time and it really helps with, with your performance as an actor and what you're doing. Um, it got obviously a lot of attention. Um, it was a sprawling miniseries. They just don't, they don't do those kinds of things anymore, not, not for the, the, net, the main networks anymore anyway. CBS, ABC, NBC, they don't do any of those things anymore. Yeah. I remember, oh, God, when there were so many of those, you know, like um, the Thorn Birds and, yeah. um, um, God, so many of them. All those romantic novels, uh, you know, basically that were turned into into miniseries, and, they, and that was kind of, that's what, that was very popular in television. You know, that, that's what got a lot of ratings. And, you know, obviously when you're a viewer and you don't have a lot of options, I mean, you didn't have thousands of channels to choose from back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, HBO was was unique, but not every household had HBO at the time. And it, mm-hmm. it was a service. And, um, so you still relied on, on the three main networks for your entertainment. And uh, so when they did a movie of the week or they did a miniseries, that was must be television back then. Um, and now it's, you know, you, especially young audiences, they, they get their entertainment not even necessarily watching television. They get, it, they get it from their smartphones or their iPads and they're watching YouTube videos and, and the like. And so you know, we're, we're more into consuming, like binge watching, you know, our favorite television series that are on cable and so back then, to do a miniseries with an all-star cast was a big deal, and a lot of people watched it. And, you know, you still, even to this day, you have, um, I've been invited to uh, to stop by, the, there's a Facebook page with fans of Centennial. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that series was done back in, in 19, you know, 79, in 1980, when it rolled out. And, um, and to this day, you still have, you know, fans of that miniseries, and it's it's usually playing, you know, once a year somewhere, um, and people gravitate to it, and they, and that, you know, when you actually sit down and, and, and consider all of the episodes and the, and the scope of what it took to actually make that miniseries work, it's really quite an accomplishment, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Then comes the hugely successful On Golden Pond, still a classic to this day, did you compete with a lot of kids for the role of Billy Ray? Yeah, the um, it was said that they started in California and went all the way to New York, so they were basically hitting major you know, cities in between. Um, and I auditioned five times for for Golden Pond for the role of Billy Ray. And uh, I remember when I first started, you know, auditioning in New York, it was you know. See a large group of kids in the in the waiting room, basically to go in. And as I progressed, the the numbers went you know smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember you know recognizing some <clears throat> not necessarily to everyone else out there listening to this, they wouldn't know some of these 
actors by name, but the actors that I know from from that time growing up who were also very big into in doing theater in New York, who I consider to be very talented actors, were up for this role. Mm-hmm. And um, and I remember that uh, the casting director um, that I first saw, her name was Diane Crittenden, saw her for the first three times or so. And then um, Barry Primus, who is uh, an actor himself, a very close friend of Mark Rydell, he was uh, asked to, uh, to step in the fourth audition. And I really think it was the fourth audition that uh, set up the, the final meeting with Mark Rydell, the director, because Barry asked me some really very personal questions that mirrored not only my life, but also the character of Billy Ray. Billy Ray was, you know, he was this 13-year-old um, boy that was full of angst, and he was just trying to navigate kind of what was going on in his life. Um, his father, who is now you know, divorced and uh, engaged to somebody else, and, and, you know, in many ways going through puberty, Billy was kind of on this island. My own personal life, um, my parents were uh, separated and soon to be divorced themselves. And, um, you know, I was the, of the six, my younger brother was five years my junior, so I'm, I turned 14 years old just before the film started mm-hmm. July, in July of 1980. And um, so it was, you know, the questions that Barry kind of asked me were very, you know, were, were not, I mean, he said, let's not even read the scene. Let me just talk to you. And he would just ask me questions. And mm-hmm. and so, but he was taping this the whole time. He kept me, and he left the room at one point to let me think about it, on, think on a question. And obviously something that that was registering um, on the video there was um, appealed to Mark Rydell, the director. Mm-hmm. And so the fifth time um, was just a meeting with Mark. And... Um, we talked more about the character, but he was asking me <laughs> some other things like, did I know how to drive a boat and things of this nature? And what about being on a boat and fishing and all this? And it was roughly about a week later after that meeting that he called me. Mark called me and goes, what do you think? You want to do this? And, and I was just over the moon happy. A lot of people don't know that um, I also did voice work, voiceovers. And so um, Henry and I worked indirectly because of a television commercial he did. He did a Viewmaster commercial um, Mm -hmm. at one point, and he's looking through the slide in the commercial, and there's a young voice. One of the slides is of the Washington Monument, and you hear a kid's voice saying, that's the Washington Monument. That was my voice on the commercial. So um, Henry and I had more or less worked together six years or so prior (laughs) to us actually working on the film. Um, Mm And it was just the most wonderful experience in the world. It was Henry Fonda and Captain Hopper and Jane, they were all terrific. Yeah, did, did you take away a lot uh, learning from them? Absolutely. They were um, they were all very different. Um, Henry was extremely old school. Uh, he was just, he had a, this theater background. The written word was very important to him. He would rarely ever change a word that was written in the script. Um, and he was just, He was a very quiet individual. You could always get him talking on a personal level if you asked him about cooking or fishing, Mm -hmm. subjects that he genuinely enjoyed. Uh, Catherine was much more intense. Um, You know, she was giving 110% every day, every, you know, and, um, and so you had to keep up. And, you know, this was Jane's gift to her dad. She bought the rights of the play to make into a movie. Mm-hmm. for her father and Jane was coming off nine to five the movie mm-hmm. and uh, she was <clears throat> she wasn't there on the set all the time her schedule was a little different in terms of uh, filming her role of Chelsea and so she would fly back to California to do other things whether it was for publicity for her movie or, or other projects that she was involved in and she would come back and the one takeaway from Jane is that she has a very strong handshake when you meet <laughs> her for the first time. Um, she means business. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, she's, uh, and it was just, um, you know, we did this all in location outside 
of Laconia, New Hampshire. Um, and it was, it felt very isolated. People may not remember this, but there was a writer's strike going on at the time in Hollywood. Right. And we were one of maybe only two productions that got a special exemption in order to make this movie, mainly because of uh, the circumstances with Henry's age and, and Catherine and the fact that these were, this was the first film that they had ever worked on together, even though that they had known each other, which was kind of mind-boggling, you know, in their careers. And uh, so um, it was just kind of one of those special, you just, every day it just felt special. Every day it felt like something great was happening. Um, very talented crew, uh, Billy Williams, the uh, famed cinematographer, Mark Riddell is a wonderful director, uh, Ernest Thompson's writing. Um, uh, it was just special all the way around. And so you, you, everybody kind of felt like there was something really special happening here. And, and uh, it was just, from my perspective, an absolute privilege to be a part of it. You know, very special. Mm -hmm. What about working with Dabney Coleman? Dabney is great. I mean, he's, but he's, um, you know, I remember thinking that, you know, uh, comedy is serious business. Like he, um, he was so good when you're watching him work. Mm -hmm. um, and then as soon as you say cut, he wasn't, um, it wasn't as if he was, uh, he was still all business, you know. He, he came to the set to work um, and really be there for his character. My other takeaway about Dabney is he's, uh, he's a very athletic guy. He was really into tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, very good tennis player. Um, I thought I was a decent athlete and one, uh, went to play tennis with him one day. He invited me to, and he was just kicking my butt all over the court. I mean, he was just, <laughs> um, laying into me a little bit. He wasn't going to let uh, a 14 year old kid beat him basically. Yeah. Um, but a very talented man. Um, but you know, he, it's funny. I, I bumped into Jane over the years and I used to live on the West side, uh, in San, in the Santa Monica area. Mm -hmm. And, um, I would bump into her, whether going to the movies or something like that. Um, uh, but I never to this day, I mean, after, and this was, you know, however many years ago now, uh, I've never seen Dabney since, since the movie, since we wrapped the movie, never saw him. I, I was invited to Henry's uh, house um, right before he passed. Mm -hmm. uh, very talented artist. And so he invited me to spend a couple of hours. It was basically a, a lunch, if you will, but I saw some of the wonderful... Of painting uh, and drawing that he did, and um, incidentally, the, he wears three different hats in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and he made a, a lithograph was made of a drawing of the three hats that he wore that he drew, and uh, I was fortunate enough to receive one of them from Henry. Um, just a you know an absolutely lovely man, and I you know while I didn't I, I obviously didn't see um, Catherine afterwards. She did write me a very nice letter, um, you know, post uh, the making of the movie, mm -hmm. and that was uh, that was something very uh, very sweet. But you know, it's you make movies and and you come together as a quick you know as a family basically to, to, to make the project, and then you kind of leave, and sometimes you remain close friends with those people, and sometimes not. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get into talking about mischief, and that one. That's one project where Chris Nash and I, to this day, are, are very good friends. And Catherine Mary Stewart, I see from time to time. So uh, it's it's funny. Uh, some some friendships are lifelong, and others are, are just short and sweet. But uh, the memories last forever. Mm -hmm. Before we get to mischief, though, I wanted to ask about Night Crossing. That's oh, yeah. a that's a Disney movie that people don't remember. Yeah, it's you know, Delbert Mann was the director, and I had worked with. This was another case where I'd worked with Delbert in a, a television movie um, in the 70s called Tell Me My Name. And certainly on Golden Pond, um, you know, when, when you're associated with a film, when there's an anticipation about a film, um, it obviously helps an actor's career. So I literally had just wrapped uh, um, on Golden Pond around September of 1980. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm being asked to, uh, I mean, I went, I went back to New Jersey to go back to school, and I was only there a couple of weeks when all of a sudden this Disney film came to be, and um, Delbert knew me and wanted me to be, uh, to play the part of Frank Strelzik mm -hmm. in this 
this movie Night Crossing. And uh, before you knew it, I was packing my bags and going off to Germany. Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but um, my brother, <laughs> who um, had really never never acted before, um, plays my brother in the movie. Uh. And I think Delbert did that basically for you know in a way he yeah, he knew that we were going to be abroad for so many months, and it wasn't a pivotal character in in the film. And I think he felt like to have family over there uh, would help me a lot. Uh, you know, and so. He cast uh, he cast my brother Keith in, in 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 the younger role as my brother, but here you know again I'm 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 suddenly now working with John Hurt and Jane Alexander and Bo Bridges and Glennis O'Connor abroad, and it's an international cast um, about a, a a real life story about two families who built a hot air balloon in East Germany and escape into West Germany, and. Um, Fascinating story. We got to meet the the real life uh, families who they just they couldn't be have been nicer. But um, you know, it didn't find its mark with a lot of people for for some reason. I thought it was kind of exciting, but the um, it just uh, it, it didn't it didn't really hit like I think people anticipated it, it hitting, which was uh, you know unfortunate. But uh, it was a, another really fun time in my life. I'm, you know, I'm coming off on Golden Pond and now I'm in German for the next three months doing this real life story and uh, with an amazing actor. Oh yeah, John Hurt, Bo Bridges, Jane Alexander, whose um, daughter-in-law, uh, Maddie Corman, is a frequent guest on this podcast. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that was at a time when Disney, you know, was struggling to make money and then they formed Touchstone and that kind of helped them. Right. You know. and Disney was kind of like in between phases. Like they didn't they they were trying to they were trying to somehow break a certain mold that they had in, in family entertainment. They were trying to push the edge with some excitement and, and and kind of delving into certain topics but kind of keep the family film and so they were another they weren't, you know, fish or fowl basically. Um, and you know Speaking of that cast, John Hurt, I mean, and again, I'm 14 years old. I'm kind of really spreading my wings a little bit as an actor. And and I just thought John Hurt was just the man. I, 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 I can't say that I really had up until that point, you know, granted, even having worked with Henry Fonda and admiring Henry, I can't say that, that there was um, somebody in the industry that I just – idolized, if you will. And John, for me, was that. I mean, he was, the elephant man was out, and I just thought he was such an interesting, fascinating, uh, both actor and, and person. He was a very intense individual, but in a good way. And um, and I just, you know, I loved watching him um, work, and it was really interesting to see how he you know, kind of like on Golden Pond, you know, John was very different. I remember conversations that John and Jane would have in terms of talking about the craft. Mm -hmm. Just They went about it differently. Um, you know, John was much more of, a, of somebody who preferred to use more of his imagination and less reliance on, on research for something. And Jane was kind of the opposite. I mean, she felt like if research was available, we'll absolutely you know, delve into that and use that you know, for your performance. So it was interesting to see how these two kind of approached the, the craft differently. Uh, but I just thought he was absolutely wonderful. And of course, when he passed not too long ago, I was just so saddened by it. But, yeah. um, it was, you know, another really incredible experience in my, in my young uh, acting days. Mm -hmm. He was great, yeah. Then comes the role that I will always love, Jonathan and Mischief. Yeah. Now, yeah, my brother is nine years older than me, and he had it on tape from HBO when we were kids. And when I was four years old, I watched it while my parents were asleep. And Kelly Preston was the first girl I ever saw naked. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy was my first huge crush, and she's been on the podcast four times. I, I've told her, you know, and 
I, I told her too. I, I, at that age, I wished uh, that she had a sex scene too. But now that I'm older, I'm glad she didn't because she's better <laughs> than that. <laughs> How did you get so lucky into getting that movie? It was really um, well. First of all, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it. I was turning 18 while making that film, and so you bring up the uh, the sex scene with with uh, Kelly. They purposely scheduled for me not to have that scene, even though it's more of a comedic romp, mm-hmm. uh, until I, until after my birthday. So we didn't film that until after June 10th. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of how this came about, it's just, um, you know, acting, it kind of goes in waves. Uh, you know, after doing all those other projects that I mentioned, you know, I'd go back, uh, finish my schooling, and I was graduating... Um, high school in 84, and my I have to say that the teachers, all my teachers growing up, couldn't have been nicer. The school system was absolutely fantastic. They understood that this was kind of a unique situation as I was growing up, so I would leave school. I would have tutors to help me with my work. I would come back. Well, the reason why I bring all of this up is mm-hmm. for me to be able to do mischief in the first place, I had to end up taking all my finals early. So. You know, we started, I think, filming the shift sometime in April, and the school year goes to June, so they were good enough to, to allow me to do all of, you know, take all of my finals before I even left to go do, you know, the film. Mm-hmm. The film itself, I flew out to California, and as I sometimes did, you know, I would spend maybe the better part of a week in California just taking either meetings or auditions for different projects before going back to New Jersey uh, for school. And I don't know if, if people remember the movie Mask um, mm-hmm. with Eric Stoltz. Well, Eric Stoltz was also auditioning for Mischief. And oh. as it turned out, Eric Stoltz and myself were both being considered for both projects, seriously being considered. Um, the story goes that the two production companies or studios were talking to one another, trying to figure out which one would, which, you know, where they were leaning. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I honestly think that if Eric would have done mischief, I would have done math, believe it or not. <laughs> so it just turned out that, and, and I also give Chris was already, Chris was already cast. And so when I was auditioning for mischief, I was doing my readings with, with Chris. And, um, my understanding, Mel Damsky was the director. And, uh, after, after one of my readings with Chris, um, Mel turned to Chris and said, you know, of all the people that you've read with, you know, who would you like to work with? And Chris said, Doug, you know, he said, I really, I, I think that we have really good chemistry and I, and I think, you know, he's the guy that, that would work the best with it. So I owe Chris that. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're off to Nelsonville, Ohio. And, you know, this was the first project in which I'm really working with actors more my own age, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, up to this point I was working, I was always the kid basically working, surrounded by adult actors. Well, here I am really working with people close to my age and we just had, it was so much fun. Uh, again, for me, doing something in the 1950s is always a lot of fun. I just think it's a certain time period. There's a certain innocence in my mind anyway about it. So wearing the clothes, driving those cars, Mm -hmm. that's a lot of fun. It starts with Mel Damsky, the director, who, again, this is a situation where Mel had actually directed the pilot episode for Big Seamus, Little Seamus. So I knew knew Mel. um, But here he is. He's now now working with me and talking to me as basically a young adult. And um, he was just... I really enjoyed my interaction with Mel regarding this role. And the other thing, the other thing that was important, even though it's a comedy, mm-hmm. I really wanted people, you know, it's easy to be very, it's easy to get typecast in, in this business. You know, after On Golden Pond, people really just wanted to offer me, you know, roles with kids who had smart mouth and, you know, mm. um, it's kind of problem kids, if you will. And then, and then uh, I played a, a television movie called An Innocent Love, in which I was kind of like a brainiac nerd, and 
and they just wanted to see me. You know, so throughout my career, it's, it's you know kind of been well, he's done this, let's see him do it again. So when Mischief came around, it was really important. You know, as a feature film, I wanted to I wanted to try to show a different side to myself than some of the other characters I had played up to that point. And um, and Jonathan was just you know he was just that he was like kind of this wholesome coming of age you know kid not necessarily a nerd but he just he hasn't gotten a handle on things yet mm-hmm. and um, and it was just it was a lot of fun like it didn't feel like work it just every day you came you came to the set and um, the experience that I had with all of them and the friendships that have maintained afterwards. Um, you know, I had mentioned Catherine Mary Stewart. She comes out here to L.A. and we yeah. get together from time to time. I talk to Chris uh, a bunch and we see each other from time to time. I don't see Kelly as much. Um, you know, she married uh, John Travolta and mm-hmm. has her own private life. And Jamie, my goodness, <laughs> Jamie uh, is now uh, married to, uh, you know, the, the, the owner of the Atlanta Hawks for playing out loud. Yeah. So uh, we don't we don't see her you know really anymore. If I'm ever in the Atlanta area, I'm sure I, I could give her a call and go see a basketball game or something. But um, <laughs> she was just so wonderful. Um, she was she came from Chicago and she had come out to LA and, and she's such a talented. So it, it just we had such talent on that movie. It was so much fun to do, and we really enjoyed each other's company. And so it's. Yeah. Whenever I'm asked in terms of all the films that I've done, I think people always think I'm going to stay on Golden Pond was my favorite movie to work on. And Mischief was really my favorite just because it was such a wonderful time in my life. Yeah, it's such a talented cast. You and Chris Nash have a chemistry that's so unparalleled. It's it's one of the greatest pairings in movie history, I think. Oh, thank you. That's very nice of you. Yeah. And uh, you, guys, you guys shot it in Ohio. It, it looks like the weather was pretty rainy and, and overcast, was it? I, you know, my, my memory of that, it wasn't. I, it, it may, there may have been some days that kind of looked like that. Um, but I don't remember whether it being too much of a factor, to be honest. Um, you know, we obviously had day shoots, we had some night shoots. But I don't remember it being too rainy, to be honest. And the people are great, by the way. Um, you know, it's, when you, whenever a, a movie comes into town, I, I think they, you know, everything the People who are watching from afar think it's, it's um, you know, Hollywood, and it's, making a movie is not the most exciting thing in the world, trust me. Yeah. It's a, long, it's a lot of hours every day where it doesn't look like anything is really happening. Um, but the, the, the people couldn't have been nicer while we were there. And I, I think, I, I'm, I'm told that they, they still show the movie, they kind of have like a, an annual screening of the movie, you know, in and around Nelsonville, you know, even all these years later. Um, so I'm glad they've embraced it so much. But yeah, I, you know, it's, Mischief was was one of the last, if you want to call it, sexploitation movies that were made. Um, you know, we, have, we live in such a copycat business that mm-hmm. when the movie Porky's was made, then a whole string of coming-of-age uh, romps, if you will, were were made, mm-hmm. and I remember people saying to me that when Mischief came out, and of course they advertised it with me falling out of a, a 57 Chevy with, with Kelly Preston, and, and in some <laughs> mock-ups they actually had me holding a pair of, you know, her panties, you know, dangling from my, yeah. one of my hands, and I had people come up to me after the fact and said, you know, I didn't see that movie in the theater because, you know, I, I just, the whole thing was oversaturated with these sex teen comedies. Where I was just over it. And they said, but when I eventually did see it, whether it be on cable or they rented it back way back when, when it was on VHS, they were pleasantly surprised because it wasn't that, you know, even though it was, yeah. it was more or less advertised as one of these, it was more than that. It really, it, it was... It was done, you know, in in a really more, um, for lack of a better word, respectful way, and uh, it was touching at times, and it was obviously funny. Um, but they just, you know, and so I think it had it, it it became more of a cult movie to a lot of people after the fact because of the people that didn't see it in the movie theaters said, you know, this was actually a very good film, and it, and it just. Um, it might have been the advertising at the time that kind of 
they yeah. believe it was going to be a certain kind of movie, and when it when it was more than that, you know. Yeah, it was a lot deeper, and it had it had um, the same kind of um, pre candy assassination sentiment that uh, American Graffiti had. Oh, that's very yeah. That's a, that's a terrific insight. Um, I, I I think that's true. I think there was certainly there was just kind of an innocence, and depending upon where you are in your life, you could certainly identify. I think everybody everybody can identify that period of time in their life that regardless of whether it's the 50s 60s or present day you know puberty is puberty but you but there's a certain kind of nostalgia that if you're of a, of a certain um, age group that you you appreciate and I think we captured that in a, in a nice way mm-hmm. when you did um, heart of a champion did you tell Robert Blake about that little rascals pilot <laughs> no, um, we shot Heart of a Champion in about most most television movies uh, are shot within 21 days, mm-hmm. and um, Robert is a tough cookie. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if you can just imagine mm-hmm. um, the persona that he kind of the air that he gives off, you know, when just looking at him uh, on film. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's pretty much that way. Uh, we he, I didn't get very close to Robert um, while making the movie. Talented man, obviously, um, mm-hmm. but uh, he's he's an actor that uh, you know once once they said cut, that was it. We kind of went our separate ways, so we didn't have a lot of in depth conversations with him. One of my dear friends um, in life, actor Burt Young. Oh yeah. He just, uh, I love him to death. And for anybody listening, Bert was uh, famous for playing the role of Pauly in the Rocky movies. Right. And I've worked, uh, you know, Bert was so instrumental in my career. And I bring him up because he was, he knew Robert very well. He was friends with Robert. And I would call Bert um, and say, you know, I'm working with Robert. And I said, well, boy, he's a, he's a tough cookie. You know, he's, he's not... He's not warm and fuzzy, and uh, Bert would laugh and, and say, "Don't worry, you know, uh, uh, everything's going to be fine," kind of thing. But um, no, he's uh, you know, doing Heart of a Champion was also very gratifying in another way because I, um, you know, Sylvester Stallone was the executive producer on that, mm-hmm. and while I didn't get to know Sly too well uh, doing it because uh, he wasn't there all the time. Um, Jimmy Gambina, who, if anybody saw the Rocky movies, he's the small uh, corner man uh, who helps train Rocky. Well, Jimmy comes from a boxing family, Mm -hmm. and Jimmy was hired to train me uh, for the television movie. And we only had so many weeks, but I got into the best best shape of my young life, you know, at the time. This is Mm post-mischief. I'm like 19 years old, but... um, Jimmy put me through the ringer just to get ready to do the boxing sequences. And uh, Ray Mancini couldn't have been a nicer guy. The reason why Ray himself didn't portray himself in the movie is that he was actually training for his second fight with Livingstone Bramble. So he was huh. training. And, um, but, you know, Ray had acting chops. He wanted, he wanted to do more acting, certainly post his boxing career. And... Um, and so while I didn't get to meet Ray while we were making the film, as soon as the film was over, we actually, uh, the producer, the director, myself, flew to Vegas, and I got to meet Ray and actually watch the Livingstone Bramble fight. And he couldn't have been a nicer guy. Uh, Ray is also somebody that from time to time, um, you know, I say hi to. Um, he just, uh, he's, he and his family, I got to meet his, uh, his, his mom and dad at the time, very nice. So you you know you just when you understood when and this is a, a terrific example of when you actually get to meet a real life person and you get to meet some of the people in their lives how much it affects your work as an actor because you started I started to understand you know the, the premise of our television movie was was that he did it for his dad you know he you know his father could have been or had it was in line to basically fight for the lightweight title, but he had to go, he, he postponed it to do his service in the war, and fight in the war, and he, and he got hurt. Uh, he got 
shot up, and so he was never able to, to get that, that shot at the title. And so Ray's motivation to actually become a uh, lightweight champ was, was really to honor his father. And when you actually meet his family, um, you realize how important that was to Ray. And it, and it certainly helped when I had to do some of the, the scenes that I was doing in the film. Uh, it just uh, is a really very special individual. Mm, yeah, I used to see that one a lot on TV back in the day. I remember that 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 TV movie very well. I I, I remember uh, you you were in my favorite episode of Murder She Wrote. <laughs> Do you know who I played tennis against in that in that episode? Ah, it's been a while since I've seen it. Refresh my memory. Brian Cranston, believe it or not. Oh, that's right. Brian Cranston's in it. Brian Cranston. I'm playing this John McEnroe type tennis player. Mm-hmm. Ryan Cranston, uh, obviously of Breaking Bad fame and, and other movies now, uh, he he was my opponent, um, and so um, I haven't really <laughs> been able to see Brian or remind him of that. But isn't that funny? Yeah, way back then, and that was again, Murder Show was one of these very popular shows that um, you know, if you it was an honor to be a part of it. Like you were almost uh, if you had the opportunity to to play a small role or a guest appearance in the Angela Lansbury show you did because it was kind of the thing to do at the time. And that came together very quickly. Also, Linda Hamilton from the Terminator movies. Uh, right. Was, uh, was in that. So it was just kind of surreal. It was one of those things that would just happen. You know, a call came in. Would you be interested in doing this? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? And uh, before, you know, a couple of days later, you're actually doing the show. So it was fun. And uh, my good friend Kelly Maroney is in it. Yeah. Yeah, she was my first friend I made when I came to L.A. in adulthood, and I just adore her so much. She's been on your podcast as well? She hasn't um, had time, but uh, she did let me interview her um, at a um, uh, horror film festival about a year ago, and it's on YouTube and stuff. But, yeah, I I just adore her. She was great to work with. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's it happens so quickly, you know, and mm-hmm. sometimes you don't have the luxury of always hanging out and talking as much as you would like to. It, you know, it moves very quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the most that you really have, the most that you have is maybe at lunch. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're just kind of sitting around eating lunch and kind of talking. And you yeah. don't want to talk shop too much. You don't, you, you know, sometimes that's the last thing some other actors want to do is kind of talk about some of the other things that they've been doing. They'd rather talk to you, obviously, just, you know, simple conversations about life in general, their kids, whatever it might be. Right. But, um, but all, you know, very pleasant. They were all just, you know, terrific. And you just kind of went in there, you, you did your job, and you, and, and you left, basically. But it was fun to do, nonetheless. And I, you know, again, it plays, you know, Mauricio plays all over, all over Europe or what have you. And, and um, all of a sudden, somebody will write and say, hey, I just saw you last night. Um uh, one of my friends from growing up literally just dropped me a line because uh, an episode that I did of Ray Donovan, you know, showed up and, and said, hey, I just saw you the other night. Uh, I there was there was a time earlier in growing up that I would sit and watch the work that I did. Now now it's hard for me. I just it's not. I invest what I can into the work, but I'm less interested in actually seeing it afterwards. It's kind of a strange thing. It's hard to explain. But uh, yeah. um, a lot of actors don't like watching themselves. It says, especially as we get older, for whatever reason, it's it's um, it, it's hard to articulate. It's it just once you put the time and the effort into doing the work, you almost don't want to revisit it again. Um, and also, there's more of an understanding that, for example, I did a film, LBJ. Um, in which I, you never knew I played Hubert Humphrey, but that's who I played. And I'm, yeah. I'm at the very end of the film. Well, there was a screening for it. Uh, Rob Reiner, who is an absolute pleasure to work with, and was excited to to work with Woody Harrelson. But when they showed the screening, all of a sudden it's edited in a certain way that you never anticipated, and um, you never really see me or understand who my character is. And I understand that that's, kind of what happens, you know, when you get into post-production, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, that's out of your control. So I think the older I get, um, you never know how you're going to be represented or how you're going to be seen. 
and certainly don't want to be disappointed if it didn't match what you were thinking in the first place. So it's almost best for other people hopefully to enjoy it and comment on it, but not necessarily see it yourself. Yeah, I was surprised that LBJ didn't, didn't do that well. And it seems like a lot of biopics the last few years haven't been marketed correctly. Maybe that's why they haven't done well, although um, Bohemian Rhapsody did pretty well, obviously. Yeah, and, you know, on the subject of LBJ, Brian Cranston um, had done his version called All the Way, which I think was first um, done uh, in, uh, in, uh, on Broadway or off-Broadway in New York. And then they, they made it into a cable movie, and he was wonderful. But part of the problem is that when you have uh, two projects that are basically the same, you can't put them out one after the other. And theirs came out first. And so I think, you know, they, Castle Rock made the decision to delay it. Um, at the time we were making it, we were getting a lot of attention and a lot of hype. Uh, also because of the actors that were attached to it, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee being one of them. And um, but when it came out, it just it didn't ha- it didn't make the splash that they were hoping to. And um, and it, you know it just you know that's that, that's just part of the the, the business at large. We um, going back to another miniseries that I did uh, called uh, uh, At Mother's Request. Um, that miniseries was being done at the same time that another miniseries of the same subject uh, was also being done at another network. I can't remember if it was NBC or ABC. Mm-hmm. Net, the Nutcracker. And so there's this competition, you know, who's going to put out their, their miniseries first? And, you know, is it going to be better received than, than the other one? Uh, I think Lee Remick was in the Nutcracker. Um, and... Um, and it did. It did. You know, it did very well. But we we needed to uh, we had to be very careful in terms of when we rolled you know ours out. Um, it just you know that's just the nature of the business. Sometimes you know it's uh, sometimes those the public uh, are fickle and, and and sometimes they just embrace you. you know? Yeah, I was pretty excited uh, when I found out that you got cast in it because it had been a while since you had done anything big. You know. Yeah, and that's you know that's also just the roller coaster nature of our, of our business as well. Um, it's just, you know, sometimes uh, it, it ha- it, there are hills and there are valleys. You know, sometimes you're around. And this is what I also say to, to you know, young actors um, seeking advice. If you think of it as, if you think of this business as a sprint, then you're doing yourself a disservice. You know, if you really, really love this business um, and you have the support of, uh, of family, especially family, uh, and certainly friends, and people that represent you. Uh, you know that you can have a very long career treated as a marathon. You know, you'll have, you could have your 15 minutes of fame early, and you can have what's considered a comeback in, you know, midlife or even late in life. Mm-hmm. But you need to, if, you, if you're in this business for the fame and the fortune, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Um, I literally, some of the happiest days of my life is literally having somebody come up to me on the street and just saying, I really enjoy your work. And that to me just touches me. It's just, that's, um, you know, when I was a kid and I knew I wanted to be an actor, uh, my agents hated when I would say in interviews, I would do this for free, (laughs) you know? Yeah. (laughs) No, 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 don't say that. Um, But there is that element that you just, such joy comes from actually doing the work itself and in the hope that you're, you are entertaining somebody out there, and that's where the real joy comes from. Yeah, that's beautiful. Do, do you have Do you have any upcoming roles that you could talk about? I just did. A, <laughs> there's a There's a show called Animal Kingdom on TNT mm-hmm. uh, that I, I did a, a guest uh, part on. Um, it's a, I before getting the role, to be honest, I didn't know much about it, and I was binge watching, and it's terrific. The actors. On that show, a terrific Ellen Barkin heads this uh, cast, Scott Stevens in it. Um, terrific. Uh, uh, so it was a lot of fun, and I play a bank manager, and the bank is being robbed. Um, a lot of my, you know, outside of acting, I, I, I do a lot of uh, screenwriting and um, line up projects that I'm developing. I have a project right now that uh, we're very 
very excited about called Silent Night. Mm-hmm. And it's about a deaf uh, college football team. Uh, Marley Matlin is attached. So oh, it's nice. in the right direction. And um, so, with fingers crossed, we might be able to uh, let people know that, uh, that, it, that it's something in the works and, and might be done later this year. But, um, but yeah, that occupies a lot of my time. I'm, you know, acting will always be a part of my life, but I, I like getting behind the scenes as well and, and doing some writing and directing. Oh, that's great. That's great. You're, so you're st- still working. You're still out there. But oh, yeah. ride the roller coaster of the business. Ride the roller coaster, the ups and downs, the thrills of it all. Awesome. Well, Doug, I, I, this was such an honor. I thank you so much for coming on today. Tommy, thank you for the invite, and uh, I appreciate your time, and, and thanks for uh, thanks for being a fan. Uh, thank you so much, sir. You, you have yourself a great day, and I will um, keep my eye out for anything you have coming out. Sounds good. Take care of yourself. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Doug McKeon. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Doug. You are, really are um, an amazing guy with all the roles that you've done and all the work you've done, and you've had an incredible life, and you're so humble and grateful to the fact that you've done it all, and you will continue to work and inspire people in the industry. And I just can't tell you how appreciative I am of the fact you came on today. So thank you, Doug. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Layer dudes.